All right, we're recording right now. So um, let me just quickly talk first about the, the main Masonic College itself. And uh, I'm wel welcoming everybody here who's present today and uh, as well as people that might watch this in the, in the future. But the main Masonic College itself uh, was founded in 2005. And uh, since then, under the uh, Grand Lodge of Maine, we've uh, used our resources to locate and develop qualified faculty uh, to share their personal expertise and their dedication to learning. So it's the college's goal uh, to offer two courses per month every other week, free of charge, uh, with the majority of those classes open to the public. So in addition, we do two semi-annual events. One's called the Celebration of the Arts and Sciences, and uh, the other one is called our College Convocation. Each uh, of those two events will feature prominent guest speakers uh, who are experts in their industry. Uh, we've also continued to develop educational ties with uh, in partnerships uh, outside of the craft. And that would include working with the University of Maine, uh, specifically in their honors program, as well as helping support their planetarium. And uh, we take part two in National History Day and provide financial support and volunteer hours to other youth betterment initiatives. And the whole goal of this and the Maine Masonic College completely volunteer, but we're all tied together by our love of learning. So uh, as Masons, we know from our ritual about the importance of studying the seven liberal arts and sciences, uh, which were traditionally grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. But uh, in the modern world, it's also come to encompass the humanities, uh, social sciences, and performing in fine arts as well. So we approach uh, our, our lessons then from this broad, broader foundation. And uh, in creating our programs, we try to pick topics of interest that would appeal to anybody. Uh, that has an inquisitive mind, whether you're a Freemason or not. Uh, while our classes sometimes may make reference to the lessons that Masons have learned in the craft, it's also our goal to academically engage with the general public and to create programs which really just are there to enrich and to stimulate mental process. So as our college motto states, we seek to bring more light to everyone that we meet. Uh, so thanks everybody for attending today. Um, let me share this screen right here for a second. In case you wanted to do the web address where you can always find more information or reach out to uh, ask either the board of regents or even a specific instructor any questions, just go to, um, to bringmorelight.org. And uh, the email is gonna be info at tobringmorelight.org. All right, so I'm going to um, Mute everybody else in the room if I can. Uh, feel free at any time. This is more of a discussion than it is a one-way lecture. So feel free at any time to jump in. If you got a question, a comment, or something you want clarified, go ahead and just undo your mic and uh, don't be afraid. We also have uh, Luke and Chris keeping an eye on the chat room. So if you got any questions and you'd rather type them up, just go ahead and put them in chat and then uh, they'll get read out to me. So um, let's start off by uh, taking you through some chronological history. We're gonna move forward based on uh, the development of uh, an understanding by different artists over time as to what uh, principles of geometry were underlying their art. Now, of course, people have different opinions uh, about how art is uh, structured. Uh, Plutarch once said in the arts, nothing that is done well is done by chance. Meaning, yes, art is completely controlled. There's nothing random about it at all. It's just that we don't always understand what's underlying that art. Of course, then my hero, Bob Ross said, we don't make mistakes, just happy little accidents. So of course, uh, yeah, we might stumble across or accidentally find some of those principles of geometry. Uh, and uh, it takes time to learn them all and control them uh, as you develop as an artist. Now, first of all, what we're gonna talk about is uh, one of the very early principles of art which is um, a balance or a symmetry. Now, uh, this is called perfect proportion is the uh, actual title for it. And it's something that we react reflexively to. So it's interesting that when the Greeks were exploring uh, perfect proportion, uh, they were using the human body as a reference. Uh, and specifically, if you note that um, the Greeks were seeking out this thing that was called consonants or a perfect harmony in all the parts. So beauty, they would say, is a form of sympathy and consonance of the parts within a body according to a definite number, outline, and position. So there is an understanding there that there is some math that underlies this. It's uh, dictated by what's called uh, consinitas, the absolute and fundamental rule of nature. Now, uh, when you hear those words, 
Okay, concinitas is a proportional correspondence in the parts and in the whole. Does that ring a bell for anybody? A perfect correspondence or a proportional correspondence of the parts and the whole? Because for us as Masons, that's right out of the order of architecture lecture. I mean, we actually hear that uh, early Greek wisdom uh, taught to us. And it's, uh, of course, you know, read out by order and architecture is meant the system of all the members, proportions and ornaments of columns and pilasters. Or it is a regular arrangement of the projecting parts of a building which united with those of the column form a beautiful, perfect and complete work. So it's easy to understand uh, in the early days that art was more coming from the gut because it wasn't necessarily aware of the principles underlying it. So the question then goes, uh, you know, where are they now? Uh, yeah, perfect proportion is still perfect proportion today. Whether you're dressed up like a, uh, I don't know, is this a lumberjack? Is this a, a, a millennial something? <laughs> but it still exists uh, to this day that we have an underlying sense of what perfect proportion is. Now, um, when the Greeks, Greeks were doing their sculptures, obviously it was easier than painting. Uh, that's because they were working in essentially a 3D medium. And as long as you were at relative eye level with uh, one of these statues, uh, it actually looked proportionally correct to a human. It was great because it was also an interactive form of art. You could walk around a sculpture and, and kind of experience the art in all three dimensions. And we just, again, know by gut when something is in perfect proportion and when something is not in perfect proportion. So although uh, you know, we came to understand that principle, as you can see in modern art, just like any type of art, we start to break the rules and go against uh, you know, nature itself to try and uh, investigate and explore other avenues. Now, let's uh, talk about uh, how this is, uh, works in art. Uh, here is a uh, perfect proportion on the left, the middle attempting to capture perfect proportion on a two-dimensional plane, and the result on the right. So you can see we're working in a statue in a three-dimensional form of art instinctually is much easier than trying to work on a flat plane. Uh, here we go with Albert Einstein, same principle. So instinctively, we can tell proportions are often not correct. So we start with uh, the Vitruvian man uh, as the first attempts at trying to find uh, you know, the relationship between perfect proportion and math. Now, um, Vitruvius was a Roman architect, civil engineer back in the first century BC, but, but also addressed um, in the book, uh, De, Ar De, Architect De Architectura, uh, trying to understand exactly mathematically what this perfect form is. Uh, obviously from his perspective, writing about architecture, but also continuing to represent that in the human form or see it in the human form. Now, as we know, uh, this has inspired uh, generations of artists to try and continue and capture that perfect form, uh, essentially using this piece of math. Now, is it uh, advanced geometry we're talking about here? No, but we come to the conclusion, some of the first rules of proportion is that, well, the average man is eight heads tall. And so that's an attempt at a measurement somehow of figuring out what the perfect proportion of a human body is. Um, here, just to show you kind of a modern version of this, uh, a female would be seven and a half heads tall, and that's the correct measure for perfect proportion. Now, one of the things you might ask yourself then, all right, if they're using the head as the uh, form of measurement to try and find proportion, then how do we develop systems to start measuring other things? Well, we did in fact use perfect proportion of the human body as a standard of measurement across many things. Uh, some of the terms that you might hear of measurement, a foot, a yard, a yard was actually the distance from your nose to your thumb, a digit, a digit was the length of a finger, a fathom, which is the length between two outstretched hands, uh, a cubit, a cubit being the length of, of a forearm, and a mile, which was 1,000 Roman paces for the soldiers. So what we're seeing here is, is that we're trying to take human measurement and apply it in a mathematical way to the external world. Let me ask you about a couple of terms, okay? When do we know the difference between when something is too large to move? Well, we weigh it against, first off, human scale. Anything that's large or heavy is weighed against what we can lift or do physically with the human body. 
same thing, you know, what defines uh, the line between something that's say normal and something that's large? Well, large is bigger than a human. I mean, that's the first kind of relative measurement. If something is so small that I might break it, again, relative to the amount of strength that a human can uh, exert. And, um, you know, is, uh, is this representation an art? Is it a threat? Is it a god? Is it a harmless nuisance? All re related to how we perceive reality. Yes, Luke, you have a question? Well, I just, I, it's interesting that there's, what you're saying is stirring up this thought in my mind that, you know, as humans, we, we try to find objective truth, but we're kind of caged within this subjective construct of our own experience and, and what we are as, as humans, even when it comes down to measurement. It's all, it's all relative to our, our subjective experience, though we are searching for an objective truth. I just yeah. find it. It's yeah. true, you know, because we talk about at this level of, or this stage of art, how really still instinctual it is. And so, of course, based on that, what are we going to look at the world as? The world is seen through our eyes. It's our subjective interpretation of it, including at that point in geometry measurement, which is true. So it is an interesting point. Um, as we start to move uh, on the tail end of the, the Greeks and some of their contributions, we start to see a, a style that they start working in called monumental scale. Now, monumental scale was a period uh, of oversized representation, but always still in correct proportion. So remember that size and proportion are two different qualities. Okay. Now, um, you might see this monumental scale continue. The style obviously is interesting if you want to create a sense of power, if you're going to make a, a statue of an emperor, a statue of a god. Of course, it conveys that sense of power. Why? Because we're measuring the, the scale of this against our own scale, and this is much bigger. So there's something powerful, dangerous, or heavy about something this large as a piece of art. Now, we move into uh, one of the first principles of attempting to mimic uh, what our eyes and how our brains interpret reality. And this particular uh, thing, technique, is called foreshortening. And foreshortening became popular and in wide use during the medieval period. The Greeks never ever would have considered foreshortening. To them, this would have been a, a bastardization of the perfect form. So foreshortening, if you look at it here and just to define it, this particular style started to realize that in proximity to our eyes, things appear different in size. Here you can see, for instance, that the hand uh, is as large, if not larger than the head itself. Uh, which is definitely not perfect proportion. But what it creates is it creates a kind of a pseudo sense of depth. It creates perfect proportion kind of in the, the way our eyes would interpret things that are closer or further away from us. And so we see this kind of first uh, principle of foreshortening applied in uh, statuary or in large scale things where you are trying to create an illusion that uh, something was in perfect proportion, but you were not looking at it at eye level. So a statue at eye level is in perfect proportion. A statue uh, that towers above you is going to be distorted because of the way our eyes work. And so what these uh, medieval artists were attempting to do is say, for instance, create these statues that would have been above head height. And if you were to look at the statues, they actually would have been maybe uh, nine heads tall or 10 heads tall. Why? Because when viewed from this angle and the way that our uh, eyes work, the distortion of the uh, statue would actually make it appear as if it was in perfect proportion when viewed from a strange angle like this. Now, um, foreshortening is not the easiest thing to do artistically. Uh, you can see here too, uh, in the late medieval and early Renaissance, when we were trying to figure out how to translate some of these three-dimensional tricks onto a two-dimensional plane, a piece of canvas, for instance, how difficult it is really to try and nail foreshortening and mimic exactly what our eyes are seeing to create an illusion, okay? 3D sculpture is, is much easier to work with, I think, because again, it's instinctual. Uh, when you're working on a plane, you're working with a representation, not an actual 3D object. It gets a lot more challenging. So in this one, you can see the attempt at foreshortening. Uh, I don't know if this one is really perfect, 
Uh, in my opinion, I think the top half is, is actually pretty good, but the feet always throw me off on this painting because it's still not correctly done for foreshortening. Now, foreshortening obviously can be taken too far in the opposite direction also. Uh, the infamous kind of wide angle you know, lens shot. Uh, and this of course is uh, it, just an exaggeration of what our eyes do. But uh, regardless, this you know, technique of foreshortening has been mastered over time and we understand exactly what it's doing, okay? Mimicking our eyes. All right, so talking about two-dimensional now, this is the challenge that they were doing uh, in the Renaissance period, was uh, trying to build on some of that, uh, that early art while trying to do it on a two-dimensional surface. Now, uh, if you look at early two-dimensional work, you're gonna see that uh, we've got two factors going here, or three, really. Uh, we start with, um, first off, the frame itself. And don't forget, a frame is actually a mental construct. There's nothing that says a frame has to be this or that. The frame itself is a container of art. And so that's actually part of the art itself, too, is to decide how this is contained. Uh, one of the other principles that they're working on was uh, composition. Where do I place items or objects within that contained space of art? And then the third, of course, which uh, we're going to see developed a little bit later in the attempts at the foreshortening, but a sense of building depth. The idea that while looking at a two-dimensional plane, you could actually be fooled by an illusion that it kind of recedes into itself. There's a sense of depth to the actual piece of art. Now, um, one of the questions I want to ask here before we move on is uh, what happens outside of the frame? So basically, if you look at a piece of art, have you ever thought about it? Is it putting pressure? Does it want to break out of the frame itself? Does it continue on in some other place that we can't see or that we only imagine? So is this the entire world in this frame? Does anybody have a feeling about that? How do you feel about trying to contain a piece of art like this? I don't know. I look at that cat on the left panel and I'm like, where's that cat going? It's going somewhere <laughs> outside of that frame. But... Yeah, exactly. The implication, right, that there is something outside of the frame. I mean, we use that principle uh, even up to modern day when we talk about rules of composition, balance, implied movement. So even then, uh, if good composition is, is present, it's always pushing at the frame. It's always trying to kind of take us into the bigger world. Now, this particular um, piece right here, we'll get to it in a little bit, actually uh, is following uh, the golden ratio. It's the uh, ubiquitous rectangular presentation of a piece of art, but uh, it wasn't always that way, okay? People did try different shapes of frame and composition as we developed this kind of sense. Uh, one of the early examples would be what's called a frieze. And this is the Bayou Tapestry. In a frieze, what we're looking at is a longer composition and often used to represent uh, time or a series of events. So this is kind of interesting. In the Bayou Tapestry, you have a 230 foot long uh, piece of cloth, which is telling the entire historical so story of the Norman conquest uh, of England. And so sort of kind of like a, a book, uh, this moves left to right uh, and you could also actually say this is an early attempt at maybe a movie or a documentary. Uh, you know, we're talking about a piece of art that actually has a, a sense of time in it, uh, which is quite an interesting concept. Do we know how long it took to make this tapestry? I mean, that's a very long tapestry. Yeah, it was actually made quite quickly uh, relative to the time. I think I want to say it was seven years to make it. Um, and the reason I say that is because between the actual uh, invasion date and the time that this was commissioned uh, for uh, a church was only a period of seven years. So they completed it and it was in that uh, cathedral and the cathedral was completed. Um, okay, so let's uh, continue about some other types of framing, okay? A frieze is a linear story. There's always movement towards some type of ob objective. Uh, I don't know as early as this, why we, we uh, read it from left to right. But I guess in Western tradition, that was always the way that we read left to right. So in this case, that's the chronology of the tapestry. It moves left to right, and that's how we read it. Now, um, what kinds of uh, things do we see in something like a frieze? 
Well, again, let's go to Plutarch. Nothing is by chance, it's all planned. Okay, the artist has a picture in their mind and they're trying to convey that. Have you ever considered that there's a certain uh, rhythm in composition? So this is interesting because when you look at this, again, it's not completely symmetrical. Not every object is like lined up. Uh, some of them are you know, in between an action. Some of them have more density. Uh, sometimes the placement of items is closer. Sometimes they're more spread out. And why is that? Well, because the artists were also considering the rhythm of placing items in a composition like this that was implying linear time. So just like a piece of music emphasizes certain moments of time as it passes, right? And, you know, we count out maybe in a bar of music, a, a four, four bar, you know, we're counting one and two and three and four and, I mean, not, we're doing nothing there but being a human metronome. And then it's the musician's job to emphasize certain of those moments as they pass, creating a rhythmic pattern. Same thing in a tapestry or freeze. Now, let's start talking then about some of the other framings that were explored to contain this art and kind of where they get their mathematical principles from. So um, in this one, we see a triptych and uh, triptychs were uh, extremely popular as altarpieces. That's kind of where they got their, their start, traveling altarpieces. And um, another one here, a polyptych, as you can see, consisting of many panels, but still all tied together. So the framing in this one is, is kind of interesting because it has two levels going. It has single individual compositions unto themselves combined with a broader message as we expanded these squares or rectangular frames out. Um, I've actually seen a lot of the paintings in this presentation. This one is beautiful. This one is at um, in uh, Bon, bon France and uh, it's in a hospital at time, a medieval hospital. Now, um, Big question. Sure, uh, go right ahead. Again, Dan, and, and sorry, brothers, if I'm hogging the air, anybody else, please hop in if you, if you have any questions. But how are these panels uh, attached to each other? Are they hinged? Are they pinned? How are they? Um, that it one's looks a, like that's a good question. I didn't get behind it. Uh, it was stuck to a wall, so I can't answer that one. <laughs> But um, okay, so um, then let's talk about um, one of the other things that we've seen too uh, in a composition like this. The frames in a lot of ways might create a, a split screen effect. So if you ever watched in a movie or a television show where you have say two simultaneous events going on, uh, that's one of the interesting things about a triptych uh, or a uh, polyptych is that you can have uh, kind of simultaneous events going on in any of the panels. Now, how about this? This uh, period in history was called the Tondo, and it was using a circular frame to contain the art. Now, one of the interesting things here, we can start to see it as we go through this, okay? As we uh, analyze a composition or analyze the movement in it, uh, it is really affected by how the frame interacts with the components in the composition. So in this case, for instance, you're going to notice in the next thing, uh, both of the, uh, the subjects in this are curved. They're kind of leaning forward to mimic the framing. Okay. The other question in the circle then is, uh, where does that lead your eye? So if you're in a circular composition like this, you know, how, what's the implied movement in it? Where does your eyeball go? Uh, one thing I will mention about art, uh, flat art that's perfectly imbalanced in its composition uh, is actually quite boring. Uh, artists have learned over time to try and create a sense of uh, movement or uh, unbalance in a way, because you don't want to be looking at a static composition. You want your eyes to read it as if it was a movie or something. They move around constantly in a composition. So in the Tondo phase, they were trying to uh, use that exterior of it to imply motion and then also to direct your eyeball this is an interesting analysis of a composition. Uh, you know, not only was there implied motion, for instance, on the, the outsides with the figures leaning, but the way that they created this curve of the arm creates a compositional trick that's called an S-curve. Okay, so S-curve. 
this is starting to look a little familiar, does it not? That uh, we were heading here to uh, the Fibonacci sequence and uh, the golden ratio in a roundabout way. That was a joke, roundabout. Um, okay. <laughs> so let's talk about then um, about uh, moving into uh, both rectangular compositions, but starting to uh, kind of dissect uh, a more complicated composition and how you're using math, uh, whether that's instinctual or at this point, he's starting to figure out the rules of composition, but how you're using math to kind of help you create this piece of art. Now, um, you have to remember too, at this point uh, in development, you're gonna notice that every single picture has one element in it, and that's a human being. Uh, still in this period, still life wasn't invented or wasn't popularized until the 1600s. Uh, why is that? Of course, because a human is perfect proportion. What better subject for art is there? Seriously. Now, um, some of the things uh, that you're going to know that we did salvage from the Greeks, uh, some of the math that they had shared and figured out early on, uh, say, for instance, music. Music was actually figured out uh, early on to be harmonic scales, uh, which is based on the math of wavelengths. And so anybody who knows music, you know, you know uh, what are called half steps and full steps. And each of those has to do with the number of sound waves present in a moment of time uh, and how many are occurring. And that kind of uh, makes them harmonious to us. So again, luckily that math had been saved. But certain other types of uh, math and math uh, theoretical exercises had been lost over time during the Dark Ages. So remember how we're looking at some of those medieval paintings and they're struggling with uh, three-dimensionality. They're you know, struggling to take a, an object and put it on a two-dimensional plane. Well, you know, the Greeks, at least theoretically, had already figured that out. Uh, they liked uh, you know, to play with the math part of it. And so the uh, polyhedra, like this, was actually math brought to life, all right? It was a conceptual or theoretical shape created by the Greeks based on a mathematical equation, all right? Art still was kind of missing that connection at this point in history during that uh, medieval period, but they were trying to get back to figuring out the ge geometric principles underlying what they had been creating. Now, um, one of the, uh, the themes that you'll see a lot of in art as we start to figure out the math uh, is uh, based on this. So the concept of a, a pentagon. Now, uh, Euclid had a fascination with this, with dissecting it and figuring out all the different relationships between these different points. And uh, it's from that that uh, we get the relationship to the golden ratio, all right? The golden ratio, and we can look at it here in a second, but the Goldian ratio is easily explained as the relationship between one part of a, a picture to another part, I guess mathematically, Luke, I don't know if that's a mathematic term, <laughs> but you know what we talk about is we talk about ratio. Uh, for instance, in this case, the, uh, the magenta line times 1.618 golden ratio number equals the length of the blue one. And if we continue that, okay, we take the length of the blue one times 1.618, we get the uh, measurement of the green line. And uh, on and on, if we take that 1.6, we get the red line. So what we start to see is that in compositions, there is math underlying all of this. It's just trying to understand the principle of why it seems to be in balance and functioning. Now to address that, talk here for a second about the golden ratio itself. Um, in the golden ratio, you know, we do the uh, multiplication, almost like a Fibonacci sequence. And what that does is that starts to give us shapes that, again, seem very natural. So this we can tell is a mathematic principle right here. This is its application in nature. So even the, you know, the great architect here was working with the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, it's amazing to say, but by nature, that sequencing of numbers is represented. Um, just a, a couple yeah. of thoughts on 
on the golden ratio. For those yep. of you who took the introduction to geometry uh, course, if you go back to the, the pentagram, um, Dan, one, one way of the way that that construction happens is that's all done with compass and straight edge, right? So with the skills that you learn for our introduction to geometry course, this would be the, the follow up on that, like after <laughs> that introductory course to decide or determine how to construct the golden ratio uh, would be the next thing uh, that you would do. Um, and uh, it is, it is everywhere in, uh, in nature. Are you gonna talk a little bit about the Fibonacci sequence at all, Dan, or is that not uh, in the, the scope of, of uh, this course, which is fine? Here. Oh my gosh, look at that. I knew that, that would excite a mathematician, that piece of art. <laughs> yeah. No, it's interesting. Um, I mean, Luke, if you wanted to mention a little bit about the Fibonacci sequence, you know, my only understanding of it from the art perspective is, is that for some reason it creates a symmetry that has a natural balance. And we're about to see it used in a lot of art once, uh, you know, the artist had gone back to realizing the important, uh, of those, uh, importance of those proportions. But did you have something you wanted to mention, Luke, about the sequence itself? Uh, yeah, I think one of the things that, uh, that makes it very natural is the mathematical rule for the Fibonacci sequence, if, if you can't uh, tell right away, is you take the previous two numbers, add them together to get the next number in the sequence. So one and one is two, two and one is three, three and two is five, five and three is eight. Um, and the thing that I think, one of the reasons I believe, this is my hypothesis, I don't have a proof of this, but one of the reasons I believe you see it so often in nature um, is because it is something that if you can create a unit and you can create that unit twice, well, then you can take that twice and add it to the one previous to it to make three. And then you can take your three, add it to the one next to it to get your five. And it just kind of builds off from each other very naturally. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons um, why you see it so frequently. I, I think if you were to build, you know, in the early days of computing, you know, Turing machines and automata, I think this is something you could program an automata, a little uh, robot, if you will, to build this type of thing out there. So that's, that's, I think, all I'd add at this point in time. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. We'll see this in a minute, uh, its application in art. Uh, but to me, from the artist's perspective, the real interesting thing is it's uh, hardwired. It's hardwired into our head for some reason that 1.6 to one is a naturally beautiful uh, occurring in nature, a sense of balance. Um, as a matter of fact, let me uh, advance here. Uh, we start to see this application in all kinds of art. I mean, it's present in architecture. Uh, you know, it's present in paintings and drawings. It's present in photography as a rule of composition. Uh, it's even present in some, uh, some hair, hairstyles too. You know, if you want a hairstyle, it's in perfect balance. Um, <laughs> so let's kind of take a, a step here into the, uh, what was called um, Leon Battista Alberti's book on painting. Now the rules, and this was published, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Alberti for a second. Born 1404, uh, definitely a Renaissance man, author, artist, architect, poet, linguist, philosopher, cryptographer, mathematician. Uh, and it's no wonder that he's actually had that title, the perfect Renaissance man applied to him when they, they teach about him in history. Now, this particular treatise uh, called On Painting, published in 1435, was an attempt to uh, record all the known rules of art at that moment in history. Now, this came from, uh, you know, two reasons. Uh, first off, uh, the knowledge of composition, math, and all that was largely limited to a certain class in that society. And uh, that class kept that knowledge to themselves purposely. I guess in a lot of ways, maybe it was uh, job security, uh, but it might've been considered some kind of holy or you know, knowledge, secret knowledge. Uh, Alberti, when he actually published this book was the first one to take these principles and explain them in such a way that the common masses could actually understand the geometry that was happening that these artists were using or were becoming more and more aware of. Um, we'll also see in a minute, uh, Alberti was one of the first artists to explain forced perspective or the concept of adding depth on a two-dimensional plane. 
And uh, you'll see how huge a step that was in the art world. Now, um, in Alberti's book, uh, he does address this question of the uh, proportions of a frame and why do you uh, make a frame a certain way? Uh, if you happen to notice, you know that ubiquitous rectangle now? Whenever you think of art, you think of your television set. That ratio of 1.6 to 1 fell in place for what we now call the ubiquitous frame. That rectangular shape is based on the golden ratio. Um, he also talked about this interesting thing, which is uh, starting to use the golden ratio in the composition itself to work out a balanced placement of the uh, items itself. And so even Michael, Michelangelo in, in paintings is, you know, this is obviously uh, uh, adding some thought bubbles, but even he was kind of making fun of the principle. So you've got this uh, character here saying, look, I'll point right at the horizontal go golden ratio so they can't miss it. And he has his finger on the, this particular point here. And I, I better point right at the vertical golden ratio so the skeptics can't say it's just a coincidence. So in using the composition of elements, yes, He's aware of, the, of that, uh, the golden ratio, and it's starting to become a, a component of, of art itself now. Uh, if you look at some of the, uh, the other analysis, the breakdowns of pieces of art that you might take for granted, uh, this is an overlay of some of the golden ratios that are found in this composition. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that um, it actually uses the the semicircle up top, which is an interesting part of a composition. You don't uh, usually see that mixed, but even that is following the, uh, the golden ratio for its size. Uh, there is a question in the chat, um, Dan, yeah. about uh, if there's a relationship between uh, the golden ratio and pi. Uh, so the 1.61 and pi, which is 3.14159. Uh, so. Uh, do you That's know a, of any artistically? I mean, I could speak to the mathematical part of it, but if there's an artistic aspect, I'd hand it Yeah, over. I thought I had noted something about that, but uh, off the top of my head, uh, no. Although we do, um, we do uh, in art, uh, do some, some tricks that I'll show as far as composition goes. Uh, so not always at that 1.6 to one placement of objects. Sometimes we do uh, what's called the rule of thirds, where we divide a composition up into uh, sections of three, and uh, we follow those rules. So, Luke, you'll have to uh, to jump out if you see an application of sure. of the placement of that in a composition, especially some of the analysis that's coming up. I don't know about the the composition, but I know mathematically uh, the golden ratio and pi are both irrational numbers, which means they cannot be written as fractions. Um, they, they go on forever and never repeat. Um, pi is transcendental and the golden ratio is not, but that'll be a topic for uh, another Masonic college class. Hope that answers your question, Brother Sawyer. So in, an, in analyzing an artist's work like this, um, I mean, of course, there's always the question when an artist begins a composition, do they have the entire composition uh, in mind already? Have they worked out all the mathematical formulas ahead of time? Or is it as they are creating the art that they're just creating smaller parts of art that come together to make a whole? Um, you can analyze art as much as you want. Uh, you know, you can go all Dan Brown on it and figure out uh, every single relationship of every single component in a piece of art. Um, you know, in this case, uh, taking, <laughs> you know, more simplified stuff here and trying to find relationships across all types of parts of the frame, the picture, the composition. Now, let's talk a little bit here as we uh, are moving still chronologically here. I wanna talk here about symmetry and balance. Now, what is symmetry? Symmetry is basically a repetition or a placement of objects in a composition or forms. Um, does that mean that symmetry always has to be repetition of the same object? No, because that's where we go to the second thing, which is called balance. So balance itself is uh, when one form is opposing another in, an, in a composition. Um, does mass and gravity play into this equation? Is there a certain sense of stability? In looking at this picture, for instance, what do you feel in this picture? This is a pretty balanced picture, I would say. The symmetry is there, although it's different 
you know, components on either side of the, of the picture. Um, and then is gravity playing a role in this? Well, yeah, I mean, it's weird, but again, we're hardwired that certain things weigh more or have a weight to them. Uh, examples of that would be uh, dark versus light. If you have, say, for instance, uh, an entirely white canvas and you put a, a black object on it, uh, if, you, if that black object is perfectly in the middle of the composition, there's a balance to it, just intrinsically. We don't know why. If I move that black area or that black object to the right, all of a sudden I, as the viewer, I'm kind of doing this. I'm falling to you know, the right. Why? Because light and dark have an intrinsic sense of weight to them. Um, and then um, how about color too? Color would be another thing that uh, is interesting, but colors even themselves, again, I think based on uh, their, uh, their scale of light or dark, also tend to carry a, a, a instinctual weight to them. We now, have a question about that, about yeah, right colors ahead. and weight. Yeah. Um, would you say red is heavier than violet? Or like, what would you, how would you, how would you weigh them be? I was just curious, like. I know, and we're talking about two things there, uh, three things, you know, we're talking about, uh, about uh, the amount of light in that color. We're talking about uh, the amount of saturation in that color. Uh, and then, yes, again, I don't know why certain colors might feel heavy, but I mean, I can attest that for instance, uh, blue, compare blue and yellow of those two, which carries more instinctual weight. You know, for, blue to me. Yeah, for some reason, blue, you know, kicks in with our hard wiring and uh, it carries weight. So, I mean, the interesting thing about it is that when you look at this composition, yeah, maybe there's a little bit of eye trace. Why? Well, because um, this is a light area in the middle, which is attracting my eyes. Uh, there's the sunshine at the top with those rays coming down. Those rays kind of pull my eye up towards the top, towards the sun. Um, but after that, what happens? My eyes are just kind of stuck in a pretty static and neutral composition. So this painting might be interesting for a certain amount of time, but it's definitely not dynamic. It's not a painting that's starting to play with some of the, uh, the rules that underlie because the artist just went for the basics, symmetry, balance, done, I'm out, okay? When we start to look now uh, at uh, painting, not only is there math involved, which we'll do the analysis in a second, but in this, you start to see in uh, the mid-Renaissance, uh, this idea of dynamic composition so yeah, we know the rules that underlie this. If I wanted to create symmetry and balance, yeah, I can do that. If I wanna place objects using a golden ratio, yeah, I can do that. But you know what? I'm gonna to start to bend the rules a little bit here and uh, use things in my composition, such as say a diagonal. A diagonal by nature is uh, a dynamic you know, form of, uh, I guess, geometry, if you wanna call it that. But if something is absolutely horizontal or absolutely vertical, it has no dynamism, it's not moving, it's, it's perfectly balanced. If you add a diagonal comp, uh, part of your composition, all of a sudden I'm feeling all these other things. I'm feeling weight pulling me in one direction. My eyeballs now uh, have a hard time not following the diagonals just because by nature there's something dynamic or energetic about the placement of that, uh, that line in a composition. So in this one, uh, for instance, uh, just doing a quick eye trace analysis, where would my eyes go? And you can ask yourself the same thing. Um, I think when I look at this painting at first, I'm in the light area up in the sky. That just happens to drag, grab my eyeball. Uh, as does the, the light columns here, okay? You can see this one actually has, starts to have a pretty decent uh, uh, crack at perspective, depth perspective. You know, you can see some of the rules here apply, which we'll talk about uh, shortly in the next part of the, the lecture. Uh, but you get kind of a certain type of uh, depth in this. Uh, but just based again on the composition, I look at the light areas first, it drags me down here and I don't spend a lot of time on the crowd. Why? Because in the sense of dynamism, uh, they're kind of at the low end of the energy scale. So where do I wanna go? I wanna follow that energy. I wanna go right up that diagonal I'm going to possibly hit this light moment. I might just continue past for a second and grab this, but then my eyes fall right back down the diagonal and I'm stuck right here on the, the main character of the composition, okay? Where is this character placed? Well, they might be placed golden ratio, 
you know, if we divide this into the into thirds and put them over here. But there's other factors at play here too, besides just that. The dynamism, the light in the dark, and the eye trace all being things that are happening. Um, did anybody have kind of a similar read of this painting? Have you ever tried to, to realize in a composition what's pulling your eyes where? In the chat room, you've got a couple uh, of answers where uh, some went to the, the little girl on the steps. Yep. Uh, somebody started at the woman at the bottom of the steps. For yep. me, actually, it was the crowd. Nice. Um, other thoughts, uh, brothers? I, I was looking at the pyramid in the background trying to figure out what that was. Yeah. And then I noticed that the bottom flight of stairs is not in proportion unless it turns halfway down away from us. Yep. Yeah, that's funny. And that's all I could stare at once I saw that. Yeah, that's a good call on there, right? Because we're starting- it's the engineer in you. <laughs> Straighten those stairs. What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, I, I think the, the fellow craft on this one needs a, a refresher course. You know? <laughs> But um, uh, Dan, what's what's going on with the framing? It's like these weird black rectangles. You know what I can tell you about that? Uh, this actually is a doorway. This is actually a real doorway because this is uh, what's done on the wall of a, I believe it's a, a monastery. Uh, sadly, uh, it was painted around this one. As you can tell, it was included in the painting. This door was not so much included in the, the original. That door was added after this was painted. So they actually punched the hole in the painting to do a second doorway. I know, poor artist. Um, I just have a, I have a quick question about the, the, the central figure there, the little girl. Yep. It seems that it should be more prominent if she was in between those rows of columns instead of in front of one of them. And so that so your eye, when you look at her, that eye, your eye goes to the space back there behind her. So yeah. it, just, it just struck me as, as a little weird. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a, actually, that's a really good point. You know, and in this case, uh, if I was doing this composition myself, I think what I would have done is left her where she is because she's actually at a golden ratio, you know, point right here. She's, uh, if we divide this into thirds, she's right here on the vertical third. And then she's almost centered on the horizontal. Okay. But uh, if I had to leave her there, I completely agree with you that I would have taken these columns and probably slid them a little bit to the right uh, and gotten that sense of balance that she was a frame within a frame, essentially, by yep. being framed by, you know, uh, the columns on either side of her. That's a good observation. Yep. Yeah. All right. So quickly, just a, a couple of things here on the math. Uh, as you can see, again, uh, dividing it into thirds, uh, which we use a, a rule called the rule of thirds. And uh, I'll see if I have, uh, I don't know if I have the rule of thirds. I can show it to you later, but the rule of thirds just essentially divides, it creates almost like a giant, uh, you know, tic-tac, uh, tic-tac-toe kind of feeling. You know, you divide a composition with, uh, into three verticals and three horizontals. And uh, where those meet in the middle uh, are called the sweet spots. So in that case, it would be where she is. She's sitting on top of one of them. There would be another one over here, another one over here, and another one over here. Uh, so you can see almost that uh, the diagonals are almost hitting that one right there. You can see here the diagonal in this composition that I was talking about and how it's reflected in the building and how it's reflected in the building on the other side. So say for instance, uh, if we go back for a second, you can see the diagonal that goes through here and you can see the diagonal that goes through here. Okay, can you see me what I'm talking about there? Okay, the diagonals in this composition. Um, so this kind of um, dynamic composition started to be incorporated more and more. Uh, this is a great painting by Car uh, Caravaggio. Caravaggio is a, a very well-paid uh, court artist for the, uh, the Pope. And uh, Caravaggio would do compositions with a religious theme. But uh, just as a side point, there was always this interesting thing of uh, homoeroticism in Caravaggio's works. Uh, and so uh, if you ever study Caravaggio, fantastic painter, but even a you know, greater life story as an artist, very interesting individual. Um, and so in, uh, in stuff like this, you know, we start to see a dynamic composition uh, used. Look at that huge, uh, high, heavy black area on the left. Uh, how does that make anybody feel? Is this like a void? I mean, my eyes obviously get sucked towards the light. Uh, in this particular case, he's using uh, this uh, and this in the dynamic composition to create essentially a giant X, 
And that X is saying, look, right here, right here is what's important. Why? Because I've got two dynamic uh, diagonals crossing. So of course my eye's going there. But how do people feel about this with all this heaviness on the left versus these bright colors and objects on the right? Does this feel think, like it's it stable it or not? Go ahead, George. I think it makes it pop. It's yep. almost like it was done on a black canvas and it was a negative type of uh, painting instead of a, the usual way. Yeah. Really brings attention to the angel. Yeah. Do you have a sense of balance in this? I mean, is, are you falling to the right when you look at this composition or? It's weird because black, the intrinsic weight of that blackness is heavier than the lightness. And yep. usually you picture things that are heavier down on the bottom than up on the top. Yep. And it has that, it has a weird feeling to it in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting when I look at it because the black is, you know, uh, heavier, as you're saying. Uh, but the weird thing in this composition is that because he's placed all the objects in the, the right or lower right corner, I actually get a sense of stability offsetting this, this black. You know, if these characters were in the middle and half of it was black, I'd fall right over. But in this case, it's using objects or the weight of objects to counteract the weight of the black. Uh, let's look at just another composition that's using a dynamic, uh, blind leading the blind. Uh, it's immediately obvious in this case, the, uh, the dynamic flow of this painting. Uh, this almost goes back to the freeze days for me because for some reason I always start at the top of a diagonal. Uh, why? Because naturally going downhill is easier than going uphill. So if uh, you create a diagonal composition just by nature, I'm usually looking from the top down. Some other people might climb, that's fine. Uh, but in this case, we definitely sense some implied motion. Uh, I'm reading it left to right, almost like the Bayou Tapestry again. And uh, you can see here what they've done is uh, they've created essentially a corridor with the two diagonals. So that is interesting in that it's not just one power line, but there's an entire power area, a diagonal area of the composition, uh, which is quite interesting. Does anybody have a comment on this and the, the dynamic flow in your eyes? Uh, another comment though on the, the previous one that just yeah, came sure. in in the chat is that they noticed in the black area, there yep. was still spatterings of light. There's yeah. that dappling of light there. Yeah, I know and it's immediately, you know, what, can, what is it? Can anybody say what these little dapplings of light uh, are creating in your mind? I mean, seriously, it's just a couple brush strokes, but what is no, it to I, you? I, I okay. I took it as a reflection of the moon on water. Yep, good call. Yeah, to me, exactly. For some reason, this is water and this is trees, you know, but. For me, I thought it was light coming in through the leaves of the trees. Like it's a very dark forest with some, some light yep. coming in there, but yeah, I don't I see it either way. It's interesting, the implication like that in art. Um, um, sorry, another interesting point is that this is going down. I mean, I mean the next one. The blind. Yep, right here. The, the direction is to going down instead of the uh, previous one uh, slide, which is going up the yep. virgin, for example. Yeah, it's interesting too. Like I told you though, that for some reason, uh, I just always reflexively want to start at the top of a diagonal instead of the bottom. And so in this case, it's interesting that in this composition, the first thing I'm going to hit actually is almost two thirds of the way up the diagonal already. I might slide down the diagonal and look at his robes, but at least for me, there's no, no way I would start at his feet. I wouldn't start at his robes and climb the hill up to my composition. So it's interesting the dynamism in this is not so much getting to the point of interest. In this, it's staying on the point of interest or am I gonna fall down? Am I gonna fall out of the point of interest? So I found that interesting in this composition. Um, Okay, so finishing up this section then, um, just starting to play with imbalance. So we're into the 1600s now. And uh, as you saw with um, the St. Francis composition, uh, as you saw with this composition, and I think it's hilarious too, that as you go down the diagonal, it builds up so much power that it's actually, they're tripping over the power of the diagonal, essentially, is what they're doing there. They're getting, you know, piled on. Um, but in this, the, uh, kind of like unbalanced or imbalanced composition started to become uh, a style, this kind of sense of movement, implied movement, this use of uh, energy and power and gravity. 
so we were stepping away from just basic symmetry and trying to kind of figure out the, uh, the math of movement and how that is implied on a two-dimensional plane. Now, uh, one other thing you're gonna start noticing in this too, uh, that they started using, where is his foot? His foot is resting on an unstable uh, point. So in this composition, he's barely holding on to balance with one foot, but his body's arched. You can sense the, the muscles uh, trying to fight that dynamism, which gives it that wound up tension of the character. And on top of that, he's not stable. All it will take is a little bit of something to take out the bottom part of this diagonal. He moves his head, et cetera, and all of the, the energy of the composition will fall into that void, you know, to the right in this case. So it was interesting uh, at this point in art that uh, we were breaking away from essentially mathematical composition. And here we're starting to actually work in some other forces that we don't quite understand yet, like gravity and dynamism, uh, but still, the artists were realizing the power uh, that's inherent in that kind of composition. Now, um, we're going to take a pause here. This is a good time for people to, you know, grab a, a glass of water or do whatever. But were there any uh, comments or questions about where we are right now uh, chronologically in uh, the art world? All right, after the break, what we'll do is we're gonna jump into uh, what's called forced perspective. And to you, you know, nowadays it might seem like nothing, but uh, any artist up until the 1600s could not get it right. So we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? So five minutes or so, see a little bit after 10 o'clock. One thing before our break, uh, Brother Sawyer just mentioned that, hey, the rule of thirds is used in all of the photography that yep. the US Coast Guard uses for public affairs department. That's like their rule. It is, it's a rule, it's a rule of composition. I'll, I'll find a, uh, a picture that has rule of thirds drawn out and you'll see exactly what it is, yeah. Okay, all right. so we'll see, see you in all in five minutes.
Hello. Why, hello there. Good morning. Good morning. I've had a problem with the mute on this thing. With huh? the mute on it? I believe our host can mute that for you if you need him to. How are you this morning? Good. Good. We're still in the middle of a break, so we're just kind of all getting back from that here, and we'll we'll get started again in the second. Hey, I know. I've been right here, but I've been muted. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oops. You can also use the chat to ask any questions as well if you're having trouble with the mute. Well, I've got it straightened around now. I found out what to click it. There you go. I've been playing with the computer a long time, and every day I learn something new. Hey, that's what we do. Every day we're learning, right? Yep. <clears throat> I'm wondering if... Brother Chris Hall is in Bristol, Maine, or Bristol, England? Don't know. Yeah. Ranesh, I believe you're in India. Yes, I am. Still it's there. a late night for you tonight. <laughs> it's 8.30 mm. at night. <laughs> oh, it's not that late. Early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, I, I, I just wanted to thank Brian for sharing the details so that I can attend this one. <laughs> and this was interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Glad to, glad to have you here. Yeah. Thank like God prime, for Zoom. It's like prime time for him. Prime time. Exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. Evening it entertainment. <laughs> With so many amazing pictures and art which you get to see and you're like I, I actually had a book and pen I was like okay let me just make some notes and then suddenly I realized you know what Chuck notes I just concentrate here right now I'll do this right. afterwards <laughs> we're recording it and that way you can watch it back early you can rewatch yes. it yes yes that, that's where I'm actually waiting for <laughs> awesome thank you you're welcome and brother Demetrios I'm assuming is in Greece Yeah. Yes, he said earlier, yeah, that he was uh, connecting from there. So Wonderful. very interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Like in the, uh, the global attendance, I'm digging it. All right, I'll start I do want to remind Monday, everybody um, that the majority of our courses are open to the public. If they were for Masons only, it would be listed beforehand. We did have that question earlier in the chat. Um, and I just want to remind folks that they are open to the public. If they were something that was or needed to be tiled, we would let folks know ahead of time that it's for Masons only. So um, I did have a question, Dan, about control at the very beginning. And I know it's probably not um, part of the talk, but I was thinking about Jackson Pollock, right? Yep. You have these artists that are trying to break out of that control. Yep. It, is that still an open argument on whether or not they were successful in doing that or not when they were splattering paint all over the place trying to capture yeah, I, I chaos? Guess, uh, or... I guess you love Pollock or you hate Pollock. I don't think there's any middle ground on that one. But right. uh, yeah, no, but as far as uh, control, that's one of the things that we'll kind of touch on in a second at the end of this part, which is that modern art basically considers itself the ultimate rule breaker. All right. But the good thing is, is that any artist that, uh, that shows a mastery of tradition right. and decides to break with tradition has carte blanche to do so. Uh, I always tell this to my students. You have to know the rules before you break them. Uh, if you try and break them without being a master, people will they'll pull back. They won't give you that uh, chance to experiment. But if you show that, yes, I'm already a master at this, but I want to take it somewhere else, then most people will just say, take me for the ride. I'm with you because I know I'm in good hands. Um, I think psychologically, that's how that works. Reminds me of some of our degrees. Yeah. Yeah, let me show you. Um, 
Let's go ahead and start up again, uh, talking about this stuff. Uh, before we leave the basic underlying geometry and move into force perspective, I just want to show an example of rule of thirds. So you can see in this composition clearly the, uh, the different elements, uh, her hips and her head sitting on two of those cross points in the rule of thirds. And then ironically, the, uh, you know, the cloth tailing her actually hits right through a third. So uh, in this case, this would be you know, a perfectly uh, composed uh, picture based on rule of thirds. Does that make sense? It's an interesting principle. Obviously, the Coast Guard uses it to great effect, as we heard. OK, so uh, let me share this part of the thing on uh, PowerPoint. Sorry for not doing it full screen, but it always helps me on the left hand side to see where I'm at in uh, the lecture. So in this, we're going to talk a little bit, uh, uh, this section, about working in three dimensions, but doing it on a two dimensional plane. And kind of the challenge at that, again, it was at first trial and error. And then eventually certain rules came out that allows us to, to create force perspective. So for starters, uh, I just want to say uh, depth perception is not something that's taught. It's something that's hardwired. Okay. What that means is that basically, uh, if you're trying to create depth perception, it's going to work or it's not. There's no in between. How do I know this? Because they did experiments uh, on very young children. And uh, what they did in this, as you can tell, this is called the cliff, the visual cliff experiment. And uh, they created a plexiglass uh, you know, area and tried to entice uh, younger and younger children to cut across that plexiglass area. And, you know, but uh, I think, let me see, uh, I think it was uh, two months old. Two months old, a two month old had an intrinsic fear of that cliff at depth perception. So that's not something that's taught, it's something that's hardwired, okay? That being said, uh, can you play with depth perception? Yeah, if you're following certain rules like Escher did, in this case, working with uh, three levels or four levels of depth perception, then you can start to mess with how the brain is hardwired. Uh, it's a quite interesting. I'm sure everybody's familiar with Escher. How about the Ames room? This is yet another uh, visual trick. And you look at this composition, you're like, oh my God, you know, uh, how can this person be whatever, nine feet tall, and this one is so small? Well, basically, again, it's following rules of perspective that are hardwired in our brain. So in an Ames room, that back wall and the floor is actually uh, not flat. And uh, all the components here, like say for instance, those windows and those uh, floor tiles, which appear to be actually correct proportion, square, are not in fact square. They're actually in the real Ames room, elongated and distorted. And so what happens there is that we're playing with what's called forced perspective. It's fooling the mind, using the mind's own hardwiring. Now, uh, this is kind of like for maybe a lot of people, just right out of uh, elementary school, if you've ever taken like Art 101, uh, one of these first rules that you learn in uh, force perspective is what's called single point perspective or vanishing point perspective. Um, to explain it very simply, if you just study this, you immediately can see that there are certain rules uh, that are at work here. First off is uh, things converge as they get further away. So they seem to get tighter and tighter and tighter in proximity to each other. Uh, that's one of the rules. We're also going to talk about a couple of other rules. But first, basic application here in just a, a painting, Rainy Day by, uh, by uh, Gustav. Uh, if you look at this, where do you see force perspective at work here? Obviously, very, very clear on this building as it kind of recedes, OK? This one is interesting. Uh, we're jumping a little bit ahead here into two-point perspective, right? Because this is on a corner, and we'll talk about that in a second. But you know, the rules here of uh, force perspective are really simple once you know them. But people did not know them for a long, long time. Force perspective uh, developed over uh, a couple of hundred years of trial and error. Now, let's talk a couple of things to you about other factors of depth perception, OK? One factor of depth perception is not only these rules of things going to a vanishing point, but also the relationship of light and shadow, light and dark, which is another indicator to us of proximity. 
All right. In this case, obviously the same exact composition for the balls, but the, uh, the reaction of those shadows, the relation of those shadows immediately goes to the hardwired brain and creates a perspective. This one is called size consistency. Yet another rule that we're hardwired for. And that's that the further away objects are, the smaller they appear. We kind of saw that in, uh, in uh, foreshortening. Remember at the beginning when we had the, the person pointing and their hand was much larger because it was in the foreground. And as we looked at that early composition of foreshortening, it was like, oh, depth perception just kicked in. How do I know that? My brain just knows it. Uh, in this case, size consistency, uh, same exact uh, size for these two people. All right. It just, our brain knows where to place them in actual three-dimensional space based on the relationship of their size. Uh, this, of course, size consistency. All right. This was another early rule that was discovered. This uh, rule is actually uh, outlined by Da Vinci. And uh, this one is called, uh, well, fade away or, or falling off textures. Both textures and colors fade over distance. Uh, I think the science behind this one is it's uh, about light reflection and reaching our eyes. Uh, it's quite interesting. Back in the early days of theorizing about this rule, uh, there was the belief that objects did not reflect light, that our eyes reflected light towards the objects. So people were trying to figure out why these rules worked the way they did, their observations, but they couldn't nail down uh, exactly what was going on, which of course makes it tough to teach or communicate to future artists exactly how to follow the rule if it's unclear. Uh, this is one of the last rules. This is in, um, you see this in film, uh, but this is called motion parallax. And uh, one of the other ways that we tell uh, depth perception is by the relative movement of objects. So in other words, if I was to look at this as a movie and it's rolling, uh, what will motion parallax tell me? Motion parallax tells me that these cars in the foreground appear like they're actually flying down that highway. They're going pretty fast, you know, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, okay? But the amount of time it takes a plane traveling at 400 miles an hour to go across this composition from left to right appears much, much slower. And why is that? Again, I'm hardwired for motion parallax, probably from my, you know, my hunting days when I was like, you know, taking down woolly mammoths or something. But I can tell based on the, uh, the observable relative speed when something is closer or further away. Now, how do, uh, how do these rules apply uh, to painting? And when do they start getting mastered? Well, like I said, um, one of the early things was this falling off of light, reflection of light. Uh, and, you know, we decided, uh, sorry, we um, were able to figure out that based on the z-axis or a certain uh, depth, uh, we would need to drop certain things. Saturation, for instance, like we said, falls away over time. Texture just loses its uh, subtlety over time. Uh, even Da Vinci was able to note this rule down and share it by saying that perspective is divided into three parts of which the first deals only with the line drawing of bodies, right? So we're talking there about part one of the lecture today, proportion, right? The outside lines that define a mass. The second with the toning down of colors as they recede into the distance, right here, speaking about reflected light. And then Da Vinci said in the third, with the laws of distinctness of bodies at various distances, size consistency. Things that are closer are larger, appear larger. Things that are further away appear smaller. So by the time Da Vinci's painting, he's able to actually uh, you know, record these rules and make them logical instead of just uh, instinctual. Now, this is a, a really interesting right here, okay? We're going to talk uh, about uh, one point perspective. The reason that I say that this is interesting is because this is one of the secrets of Freemasonry. Uh, and if you're in the art world, this is a huge breakthrough. And that's being able to visually create the illusion of mass or volume. Okay, like I said, maybe the, you know, the Greeks had it uh, uh, theoretical mass and volume at the time, but, uh, and they had the statues, which was a 3D medium. But even for the Greeks, creating forced perspective in a two-dimensional plane was extremely challenging. And then that knowledge was lost for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, 
in the Freemasonry thing, and one of the reasons I really wanted to teach this course is because of that specific line from a point to a line, from a line to a superficies, from a superficies to a solid, right? Again, right, right out of one of the Masonic lectures, a lot of times this goes right over people's heads, how hugely important that one particular line is. And that's because we're saying that if you want to uh, quantize mass or volume, you take a point in space and that point is drawn with lines. So connecting two points with a line, we connect four points with four lines and we've created a plane, a flat plane, okay, which in itself is interesting. And then from that superficies, we're able to extrude or create the mass or the solid, okay? Uh, again, that's the difference as it says in the rest of the lecture, right? Let me continue. By, by this science, the architect is enabled to construct his plans and execute his designs, the general to arrange his soldiers, the engineer to mark out ground for encampments, the geographer to give us the dimensions of the world that all things therein contains to delineate the extent of the seas and specify the divisions of empires, kingdoms, and provinces. Is geometry at the heart of all that? Yeah. Is art catching up to it? Yeah. Art's about to be able to capture the rules that kind of dictate depth. That's the difference when you think about it between representing your placement of an army like this, trying to tell your generals, okay, this is how we're gonna line up for our big attack, to this, where we actually are able to uh, clearly visually communicate uh, three-dimensional space to that where you're able to line up an entire army in a visual representation that actually looks like what it will look like, making it that much easier to communicate. And just like it says in our lecture, this type of uh, uh, you know, conceptualization of mass and three-dimensional space is basically what allows us to do everything that you know, humans can do. Every type of measurement, every type of reality, everything comes down to being able to understand depth. Now, you might be saying to yourself, okay, like I said, this is art 101. Of course I know how to create depth perspective. It's not that tough. Well, the magic system that we call one point perspective is really quite simple now. Uh, basically, if you wanna create depth in a uh, visual composition on a two dimensional plane, uh, we'll start with a, just a horizon line in the middle, neutral line. And we'll put a point, that vanishing point, as it's called, just right in the middle, okay? Here we've got the, uh, the superficies, right? Just the flat planes. You will draw lines from three of those points down to your vanishing point. You will then mimic or extrude the superficies, but down here. So creating these two you know, lines that are parallel to this flat plane. And then you will erase that to the vanishing point and voila, you've created uh, you know, a representation of mass and volume that's convincing to our hardwired brain that it actually has some depth to it. And there was a question yep. um, about the perception of whether or not that's the back wall or the front wall when you had the dotted line. Is that something that you may uh, talk about back when you went back right there? There was yeah. a question about is the dotted line in the foreground or the background? No, that's funny you, you say that um, because what happens uh, with perspective is we have uh, what's called one, two and three point perspective, depending on if I was looking at this cube uh, against a flat face, if I was looking at it from a corner uh, or if I'm looking at it actually from one of the points. And so this cube right here could be that dotted line could be the face of it. It could be the back of it. Uh, it it's, you know, there's no right answer. It's all just really about your point of perspective and, and how you start to construct this depth. Well, in isometric drawing though, the dashed lines are always hidden lines. Yeah, yeah, I think that's implied. Yep, yep. I mean, in real, uh, you know, if I was really representing it anyway, you wouldn't even see the back lines. You know, all you'll see here is just the actual exterior of the object, uh, which makes it easier to, my brain to figure out what's going on when I'm creating a bunch of these rectangles or cubes. Um, so it's quite interesting that uh, how simple the system really is and how effective it is with the hardwiring. Uh, but again, people had no idea early on exactly uh, how it worked. They came up with all kinds of rules for optics. 
Uh, I'm going to jump past some of these because we've already talked here. Um, here's an early attempt at trying to figure out how these light beams are working. Uh, and then here, you know, again, we start to talk about uh, creating objects that uh, have depth perspective. This is the one that I wanted to show you, though. This is uh, going back to our good friend Alberti, 14, uh, mid 1400s, 1435, when he did this book on painting. Okay. One of the first uh, pre people to write down these developing rules, like the cutting edge tech at the time. Let's draw a dot and do some lines. Okay. And then all of a sudden, we're going to have this sense of, um, of depth. One other uh, rule that Alberti figured out and uh, shared with the masses was uh, right here, establishing the horizontals. Now, the tough part about that is here, you know, I've got the receding lines. But say, for instance, if I wanted to make uh, that railroad, okay, how do I know where to put the horizontal ties in those rails to continue that, uh, that illusion of depth? And uh, so there was a, uh, a trick here using a, uh, a diagonal across this to actually figure out the intersection points of how our hardwired brain interpret horizontals as they head off to the, the horizon, okay? So still using geometry now and being able to express the rule so that it can actually be uh, executed correctly. And even here, 1435, he's starting to figure out, oh, okay, that vanishing point trick works. Now, um, before I get uh, too much into uh, some of this, I just wanted to talk uh, quickly for a second. Uh, one of the, uh, the founders of linear perspective, as it's called, uh, was Brunelleschi, probably best known for the, uh, the dome on the Florence Cathedral. But uh, one reason that Brunelleschi developed this or had to develop it is because he had to sell his designs. Okay, so the first real uh, use of linear perspective was for uh, basically Brunelleschi's brochures. All right, he needed to sell these ideas that this is architecturally what I can make. And so if I want to represent it to you, I have to figure out on a piece of paper how to give it to my patron in a way that they can envision too. Nice job, huh? It turned out pretty well for him. Okay. Um, moving on to uh, other objects then besides just squares. Using this type of geometry, you can extrude objects like cylinders, triangles, okay? This depth perspective starts to work on any uh, or most items and objects. Um, start to see some of the early attempts here at perspective. Are they always on? Uh, no, not all the time. Uh, sometimes you'll see some weak attempts. These are pretty good right here on this one. Uh, this one, not too bad either. Here we got the question mark here of just if the point's here or the point's up here as stuff. Uh, Seeds. Same thing here. This is one of the most famous paintings um, and uh, School of Athens. And the real irony about uh, the, the School of Athens by, uh, by Michelangelo is that uh, in it, we've got pretty good adherence to this one point perspective rule. You can see all the architecture actually flows pretty well, pretty convincing here. Okay. Except this right here which ironically, this is a self-portrait of the artist. And of all things to screw up on, he screwed up on his own part of the painting, which is that this table is out of place. The table is not following a rule of linear perspective. So it looks kind of weird in relationship to, to this. Now let's talk about, uh, and you were mentioning this earlier, one point, two point and three point perspective and how you're looking at a three-dimensional object. So far, we've been studying, you know, looking at the plane or just the flat side, right? Going back here to where we started, looking at the flat side of an object and creating 3D perspective with that. What if I say, for instance, don't want to be looking at the flat side? What if, say, for instance, I want to stand on the corner of this house as I observe it so I can see the front yard and the backyard, okay? We needed a new set of rules now all of a sudden to create this type of perspective or point of view. And this was called two-point perspective. The concept here being that instead of having one vanishing point, I'm actually gonna create two vanishing points and pretty much just 
double up on the rule of, of you know, the single linear point perspective. So this particular flat plane is going to be receding over to that vanishing point and this flat plane over to that vanishing point. I then go ahead and you know, crisscross these lines on the back for the depth. And now I've created a three-dimensional uh, illusion, uh, but from a different angle or a different point of view. Now, you know, this was all interesting and, uh, and everything. Uh, before we actually got into two-point perspective and on the tail end of one-point perspective, uh, artists got bored. Why did they get bored? Because, you know, that one-point perspective thing like this, it took 150 years to figure this one out. So to go from linear perspective on the one vanishing point to two vanishing points, 150 years before we figure that rule out. So what does that mean? That means artists start to get bored. Artists get bored with the vanishing point. So what are we gonna do? Let's go back to, uh, you know, uh, like uh, older styles of painting. Let's go back to, you know, portraiture. Let's go back to uh, stuff that doesn't have perspective in it. Let's put humans back into it. Uh, so it was kind of a rebellion against this little geometry or science uh, thing that had happened. Now, um, and eventually, during that 150 years, people were still conceptualizing, thinking, trying to figure out uh, how that rule of perspective that they had gotten down could be applied in different ways. This right here uh, is um, from 1650. And this was uh, from an, a, a kind of philosopher artist's notebook as he started to figure out, oh, it's just two point perspective. It's one point perspective doubled up. It's not that complicated. And so he would write uh, these kind of, you know, architectural things for churches and uh, communicate to people that you can in fact stand on the corner of an object. This right here is how the artists finally understood it and applied it. So this is an interior, it's in two point perspective. How do I know that? Because again, I've got one column here, that's the closest to me. I've got a vanishing point to the left as it recedes. And in this case, this column on the right is smaller. So I have a vanishing point to the right of the composition also. Here, I'm not you know, flat against all the pillars. The pillars are actually receding in two directions. What's the maximum number of vanishing points you can have in a painting out of curiosity? Or could you have- uh, three, three is easy. Uh, I think four is theoretical, but um, I'd be curious to know. We'll go up to three here at least. So the rules for the, uh, the two vanishing points, again, just based on the single vanishing point. Horizon line, in this case, because we're on the corner of an object instead of the flat plane of it, to start our composition, all we need is a single vertical line. And from there, we're going to extrude our three-dimensional object, just following the same things as we did with the single point linear, with the exception that this little trick here is that you're going to cross, you kind of create a cross on the top to get that top or that bottom plane as a representation. Is that kind of clear for everybody? It's really not that complicated once you understand the mathematical principle of it. One point. Two point. And like I said, based on where the horizon line is dictates whether you're looking down at an object directly at it or are underneath looking up at it. All right, so horizon line is dictates that. Now, uh, again, this is like a, another Escher here. Uh, this is starting to get to be a, a weird perspective now. And this starts to get to be what's called three point perspective. Okay, three point perspective is when you have an object that has, you know, the, the two point going for it. So we've got the two planes right here of the object that are represented as three dimensional. But in three point perspective, I'm standing at an extreme. I'm either looking down from a, a corner, you know, uh, up from a corner or down from a corner. So you can tell in this is kind of like, again, a, a foreshortening, you know, going right back to that idea that this object is, is huge. And why is it huge? Because it's kind of distorted as it goes away. So uh, three-point perspective is used to create um, things like this, a cityscape, all right? So. Uh, quick yeah. question uh, for you, Dan, before uh, we play the video. Yep. Um, Michael asks, using one and two point, how do you know which point to draw the lines to? So the question I think is, um, you know, we'll look at this one then, okay? Uh, in in two points, 
I mean, we understood one point is a flat plane, right? And that this distortion right here that makes that flat plane recede is a mathematical formula, okay? It's done by obviously setting up a, the, the point and then doing the lines and we're figuring out the geometry of that distortion. Uh, when we talked about two point, it's the same exact thing on this side, okay? So if you basically, you know, cut this in half, it's just single point linear on one side, single vanishing point linear on the other. Um, I think the question is kind of addressing this right here about when you have a top or a bottom to your object, which is kind of the, the weirdest math because, you know, your gut reaction is probably to, to you know, take this over here and somehow I, I don't know exactly where to, to place my line. Uh, it cuts across as such. And that's, this is the hardest part of, of two-point perspective right here. It's just realizing, yes, which dot I draw the line towards. Um, I don't know how, is that answering the question or whoever posed the question? Uh... Michael, do you want to talk towards that to help clarify or did that answer your question for you? That answered my question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. It is. It's the weirdest part right there is trying to get that essentially that third plane to, to work. But again, you'll instantly know if it's working or not. You know, you draw the wrong line and you'll be like, nope, hard wiring tells me immediately that's not correct. Okay, so um, let me play this right here and uh, I'll show you three point perspective at work. All right, so keep in mind the objects in this are all gonna be following two vanishing points to get their planes correct. And because we're way up high in this composition looking down at an extreme an angle, that's where the third point of that perspective will come in and uh, help us. So you can see he's got the two vanishing points to the right and then the third down. The horizon line obviously is high up in this composition because we're looking down. And there you go. All right. So we figured out uh, rules now, depth perception. Fantastic. We know exactly mathematically how to do it. Anybody can do it if you follow the rules. We know how the brain works and how the eye sees things. So let's continue here on our journey. And right, let me open up the next PowerPoint with it. What we're going to move on now is into places where math gets a little more complicated. And how is it that math can get more complicated than what we're already at with the geometry? That's because we're gonna talk about light and the mathematics of light. Now, uh, this was interesting as we move into this phase of art, that basically what you have is you have certain objects that you know the shape or the exterior of it might be able to be uh, extruded mathematically, like in looking at this composition. Okay, I can tell that you know on the left is a square shape, and it's following you know the rules of perspective, so I can see its mass or its indicator of mass. On the right is that kind of cylindrical thing. That's another easy one. But if I was to draw this cone, how do I tell it has mass? Because there's no linear perspective going on with the cone. Okay, similar to a sphere. Why is this not just a circle? How do I tell it has mass or volume? And that's because I'm studying, maybe uh, not really realizing, but I'm studying how light rays are bouncing off of a volume. And I have to indicate as an artist, the differences in those light rays and how they've reached me. And that will create the mass or volume of an otherwise flat object on a two dimensional plane. Does that make sense there? So when we're talking now about a whole other level of understanding mathematics, it's not only observing light, but learning how to represent mass because we know how the light works. Now, um, for us, you know, we understand again, uh, basically how does light work? Well, there's an incident ray that comes down. It hits an object based on how it, uh, you know, comes back to us, that'll dictate uh, both the angle of reflection 
as well as the surface or the texture of the object based on how the light rays bounce back to my eyeball. All right. The math of this gets extremely complicated. And uh, we'll get to that with computers uh, here before I finish today. But let's go take a half a step back and look at how artists started wrestling with reflected light. Now, uh, I might be kind of biased here, but uh, the Dutch masters are probably my favorite uh, era of painting. Uh, the Dutch masters were called the masters of light. And that's because uh, during this time period, uh, 17th century, what happened with the Dutch is that the, uh, the Dutch had broken free as a country and they were definitely into doing things their own way as a result. So the Dutch uh, focused on two things in their paintings. They focused uh, on real life. So getting away from the, you know, these uh, themes of uh, uh, exalting the church or exalting royalty. Uh, and then the second thing they really focused on was uh, because they knew perspective, the rules of that and all that, they, they worked on the next thing to master, which was the reflection of light and how that helped create round objects, you know, objects that relied on that knowledge of light reflection. And one of the biggest revolutions in the art world, the still life. Okay, the Dutch were the first to finally say, you know what? I'm so fascinated by studying the way that light reflects off of objects and not only defines mass and volume, but it also defines texture that I'm not even really gonna bother with people. I'm just gonna sit here for days and months and study objects and the way that the light is interacting with those objects. It's with this kind of study or observation of light that you start to get things like translucence on a glass. You start to get uh, smooth uh, reflections like uh, off the metal here of the, uh, of the urn or the pitcher. Uh, one other thing that you'll notice just uh, in a lot of these still life Dutch compositions uh, is that they still have morality lessons in them, which is kind of interesting because uh, the Dutch, when they represented morality in their, uh, in their paintings, were not using necessarily uh, the church as a reference or the standard good versus evil kind of uh, you know, component of their pictures. They would actually do things like um, hide stuff in, uh, in uh, their compositions. So say for instance, in this, uh, one of the common things you'll see in a Dutch still life is rotting food. And you might say to yourself, why would the Dutch put rotting food into a composition? And that's because it was a morality lesson on excess of having too much, you know, because the Dutch uh, had an amazing uh, uh, trading route and they were a very rich country. And so the painter, instead of saying some kind of good and evil thing would just put a piece of rotting food in the still life saying, you know, don't be gluttonous, don't be, uh, um, but it's funny because at the heart of it still was at least for uh, our perspective today, science wise, geometry wise, uh, the whole exercise here was to study how light interacts with objects that don't follow a mathematical formula like linear perspective. Uh, as we get into these kinds of things, uh, we start to see my favorite artist of all time, which is uh, Vermeer. And uh, you're probably familiar with Vermeer uh, for a girl with a pearl earring, that thing where, you know, it's a composition of, I don't think I have it. Maybe, oh, there you, there you go. So Vermeer's most famous painting, right? Girl with a pearl earring. And in here, uh, what we start to see why they call Vermeer the master of light is because uh, basically not only could he create, you know, perfectly realistic objects just based on reflected light, the smooth skin, that perfect fall off of the light to the shadow you know, that defines kind of, you know, this perfect proportion and all that. But Vermeer, in this painting, for instance, painted uh, this, uh, I guess it's an indicator almost of a pearl earring. I mean, how do you know it's a pearl earring? I only really know it's a pearl earring. Why? Because of this one little tiny splash of white right there, that little dot. And from that, again, it's an understanding that in my brain, shiny, hard objects, you know, that reflect light like that uh, have a dense mass. Uh, and, you know, I can tell too, just the slight hint of, of color in it. So maybe it's a silver earring, maybe it's a pearl earring. But the point is, is that it doesn't take a lot if you're a master of light to just nail it by putting only the amount of light in there that you need to indicate an object. Uh, you know, uh, the other master working at this time was Rembrandt. And uh, uh, Rembrandt, kind of uh, anti-Vermeer, uh, as a joke, was called the master of uh, dark or the master of shadows. 
And uh, that's because uh, Rembrandt, as you can see, tended to work in the other direction. Uh, yes, there was still the reflection of light and how to, it defined texture and mass, but he liked to put large elements of dark into his uh, portraits. So uh, it's an interesting way to approach the same equation. All right, a couple other Dutch masters here. Quick question on uh, yeah, the Rembrandt one that you had there. Um, yeah. Who is that little girl who is like in the light? There's a lot of dark there and they're like two light figures. There's yep. the guy in the forefront, but then there's this, this girl who looks really out of place amongst all these soldiers. Yeah, that's an interesting story. I'll tell you here just uh, quickly as an aside. So this, um, <clears throat> this uh, particular painting is in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Uh, I visited it many times. And uh, what happened in this is that Rembrandt was, you could call it a commercial painter at the time, a bit of a sellout. Uh, and so what Rembrandt would do is Rembrandt would paint on commission. And he was probably one of the highest commissioned painters at that time. So he got you know quite wealthy doing the painting. In this particular one, he was hired by a, a group of uh, upper class militia who were really kind of just, uh, you know, they were posers. But at the time, the upper class wanted to feel like they were defending their city. And so they would, you know, dress up in soldier costumes and on the weekends uh, would go out and, you know, camp out or something or have a drinking night and pretend they were defending the city. Uh, they commissioned Rembrandt to make this of them all defending the city. The uh, girl in it, uh, there's two stories behind that. One is actually a, a positive story, which is that, you know, she's the representation of the city that they're defending. Uh, the sadder story, and I don't know if it's historically true, but the, the sadder story is, is that one of the uh, upperclassmen had a daughter that had a, a handicap, a mental handicap. And uh, Rembrandt was pointing out the fact that this person was uh, extremely cruel because he didn't support his daughter and instead uh, sent her to prostitution. And so, this was, uh, some people say, a swipe at the, these very rich people that were so spoiled and elitist. Uh, so we don't know if Rembrandt loved or hated the people that paid him, but <laughs> there's stories on both sides of that. Uh, one other quick aside about the Rijksmuseum and this painting, which is quite interesting, is that if you've ever seen this painting, it's a huge scale. It takes up essentially almost the size of half a room. I want to say it's probably 30 feet wide, 25 feet wide. And it probably stands about obviously eight, 10, 12 feet high. Um, when they put it in uh, one of the museums uh, during World War II, they had the damnedest time getting it out of the museum, trying to get it to safety before Amsterdam was invaded. Uh, and so what they did in the Rijksmuseum is they actually have a connecting gallery with a walkway street that goes underneath it. And this painting of all paintings, this is the national painting of the Netherlands. This painting is in that walkway that connects the two buildings. And I always thought to myself, why would you put it in like one of the most vulnerable spots of the museum? You know, there's actually a road and a walkway right underneath this painting. And then it was pointed out to me because there's a trap door under the painting. And so what they're able to do now is if they ever have to evacuate this painting from the Rijksmuseum, they have this little maybe six or eight inch trap door. They open it, take the painting off the wall, drop it right down into a truck and drive it away. So. It's a very interesting thing about this painting, but back to the light, sorry. I'm getting away from here. Okay, so I uh, want to talk here. I mean, there are other things besides the Dutch, other people, you know, Caravaggio, Italian, they eventually started picking up on the Dutch techniques and using reflected light uh, as part of their compositions. But I want to jump ahead in time here. And there's Rembrandt himself. All right, I want to talk uh, just a little bit here briefly about uh, modeling with light. Uh, this is rules now that every photographer, every filmmaker learns, okay, uh, when they're placing light. There's actually a term that's called the uh, Rembrandt triangle. And what the Rembrandt triangle is, is this little trick of splashing light on the opposite cheek. So basically, when you see lighting technique now, if you're designing lighting, You'll have a bright source, usually 45 degrees to your subject on one side or the other. And what that creates is that creates the Rembrandt triangle under the other eye, okay? I don't know if you would call that a mathematical formula or an observation, but that lighting technique is still used to this day, adapted by Rembrandt when he was studying how to show volume and mass. 
you know, you can see the different forms of lighting. If we light from above, if we light from underneath, which has its own implications, all right? Somehow we're hardwired, I don't know. Um, camera obscura. So to kind of get us into the modern age, we have the um, photography, the capturing of light now by an actual, you know, scientific tool, I guess you would call it. So not relying so much now on how to understand how light's reflected, but kind of to figure out how we're going to capture it on a medium. That medium, obviously, uh, early on, uh, silver nitrate, I believe. And um, this is the first actual photograph that was ever taken. And it's kind of tough to figure it out. But if you look carefully, there's an archway in the back. Uh, this is the entrance to the uh, artist's backyard. Uh, I think to the right, it's probably some kind of like roof or overhang into the garden. Uh, the problem with painting, uh, sorry, with uh, photographs like this early on is it's fantastic. You're capturing light. Okay, you don't have to perceive it through your own mind. You can capture it. But this photograph would not last at all. This photograph, the second it was exposed to any light, would be immediately destroyed. Okay, so we didn't have a permanent solution in the early days until we got to this. Okay, so this is the uh, Daguerre, and you've probably heard of a Daguerre print. Uh, what Daguerre did is uh, taking a silver iodine uh, and basically forcing the silver permanently to stick to a plate based on its exposure to light, which created a permanent capture of the ways that light were reflecting off all of these objects. And so a Daguerre print could actually, you know, exist. It could, it could continue. It wasn't a temporary capturing anymore. Uh, one of the great things to notice about this, this is a street in Paris. How many people are on this street? Isn't it weird that you're in a major metropolitan area? Yeah, and there's only two people? That's because this print uh, or this exposure took such a long period of time for that chemical reaction to occur that everybody else in the street and the sidewalk who were moving didn't register. They weren't captured by the silver. The only people that were captured was this person shining this person's shoes because they didn't move for the minute or so that this exposure took. Now, uh, we've come to know now photographs done with the negative, okay? This was uh, Talbot who came up with this. The idea of all of a sudden being able to have a very photorealistic, if you wanna call it that, photorealistic capturing of light on a stable negative, allowing you now to actually make duplicates or prints just by shining light through and re-exposing it again to yet another receiving medium. Celluloid, the next step in art, Let's create a whole bunch of pictures and put them all together. Just like we used to have implied motion, this is the illusion of motion. Now I want to get into one interesting thing here as I wind down, and that's the state right now of where we are with the math of, uh, of light. So in a kind of a roundabout way, it's interesting that math and art started together with the Greeks. We talked about you know, representing a 3D object understanding if it worked or not just by the way it look, looked and felt. It was kind of like just instinctual. We've come full circle where math and art kind of split and went their own ways for a while. The artist forgot stuff, relearned stuff, adapted it, wrote it down, communicated it. We've come around now where scientists and mathematicians are now back in the art world. And what are we saying here? We're saying now that we have things uh, that are based on what's called ray tracing. Now, ray tracing is very similar to uh, photography. You know, what was Daguerre doing? He was capturing the way that light rays were bouncing off of an object, okay? It took him a minute or two to expose that. We've come to the point now with computers and technology where we can do ray tracing. In other words, you know, taking a photograph, make a film out of it 30 frames per second, make a film out of it 60 frames per second, run it through a supercomputer, and figure out exactly where each of those rays bounced off of an object and hit the sensor. So we're at the point now where we're not capturing images of light anymore, we're capturing the math of light. And what does that allow us to do? That allows us to uh, nowadays uh, capture items and create essentially a 3D model of it in real time in a supercomputer. So to give you an example of that, uh, there's a, a technology called the LIDAR, 
all right? A LIDAR is a light radar combination, essentially. It's where the name comes from. If you take a LIDAR camera, it's got the laser in it. The LIDAR camera will spin 360 degrees while the laser is out. It'll take measurements on the reflected laser back to the camera. And then what you'll be able to do is create a 3D environment of exactly where that camera was. So if you look at it in say a computer game, if you look at it through a set of VR goggles, every single light ray that bounced off a building, an object, whatever it bounced off of and came back to the camera has a 3D representation of it now, okay? The opposite way of doing this, of course, uh, is you can go around an object. So say for instance, you know, I have a person and I wanna make a 3D model of that person. I take a ray tracing camera, I go around the person, mathematically measuring all of the light that bounced off them. And then using that math, I have a 3D model of that person. It's not just a flat two dimensional capture of the light. It actually extrudes the mass and volume of the object. Now, uh, of course, you know, this is done uh, uh, quite a lot in video games. It's probably the biggest application of this technology. Uh, but keep in mind, you know, what is a video game? A video game is usually 60, at least 60 frames per second. So twice a second, the computer is figuring out where every ray of light is in this composition. And add to that that you can move around a video game. So the light bounces change as you move. That's the computing power now that we have to create actual 3D worlds in a computer that fool our hardwired brain. So science, That's geometry, amazing. math, art, bang, all came back together in a full circle. Um, so in conclusion, you know, is there a, a mathematical principle underneath art? Uh, yeah, you bet. And it took a long time to decipher all the different rules that were going on. Do we always follow those rules? No, we can break them. Of course, just like anything else, modern art loves to mess with these rules. Uh, you know, but the other thing too is what are we seeing when we look at art? A lot of times we're just seeing math represented in a beautiful way. We're seeing numbers, you know, brought to physical life. Uh, so it is really quite interesting uh, as we go full circle. So uh, with that being said, I'm happy to answer questions, address stuff, or even get your thoughts on kind of how, how this dance goes on between math, geometry, and art. That's amazing. Uh, just to see how it evolved over the centuries uh, and how it's being applied now, I think, is, is phenomenal. Yeah, it's interesting. The different tool sets that they figured out and then the rules, how to use those tool sets effectively. I guarantee calculus is used in at least what they're doing with the LIDARs and the three-dimensional the ray tracing? Uh, yeah. spaces that they're in. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going back to, uh, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Well, I was gonna, as, as a beginner with all this, if you call this 101, I'm really glad you did it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is interesting. It's amazing. Walter? Uh, going back to the uh, Dutch masters, uh, there's a, several pictures there where you have liquids. Uh, which to me is just a fantastic proof of the ability of the human brain to conquer something of tremendous capacity and, and complexity and come out with something that's so real. Uh, can, can you go back just one Yep. Uh, to one of the uh, Dutch jumping, masters? Yep, I was jumping over to it. So let's see. Uh, so something like that, like the liquid brain. in the glass there? Uh, can, can you go back just? Yeah, yeah. There's a, the uh, an example that is real. As far as the the brain to be able to conquer that on uh, a piece of canvas is a tribute to the human ability uh, at its very best. Uh, amazing. Yeah, you know what's you right, could what's... stick your finger in there and it yeah. get wet. Uh. Yeah, it's doubly interesting because you look at this and it could be done with observation. You know, if I was an artist, uh, maybe I would just sit here and sit here for a decade until I finally figured out how to create these textures. 
But, you know, there are rules underlying this. There are tricks that artists teach to the next generation of artists. So, you know, there is a way to paint liquid. There is a way to paint reflections, hard objects versus soft objects, cloth. I mean, we learn all these lessons in art school and we don't learn it by sitting there and having to relearn it all the time. They actually distilled rules out of these observations that they could actually explain a technique or a set of rules that's going on. So there is a, it's interesting, this kind of logical analysis combined with observation at the same time. It's really fun to take cloth and drape it like that. You can, you can draw on it for hours, just playing around in the folds and stuff. Yep, yeah. That's definitely uh, the first assignment in art school they always do, yeah. Here's perspective, you know it good. Now draw some cloth. <laughs> it's challenging. Any other thoughts or questions for me before we conclude today? Thank you so much, this is excellent. Oh, you're totally welcome. I'm glad everybody uh, hopefully enjoyed it and I thank everybody for sharing a couple hours of your time to, to go over this stuff. Uh, any last comments, Luke, about stuff coming up or? Yeah, I, I just want to mention that um, our celebration of arts and sciences is coming up here in April. So the 3rd of April, uh, keep your eyes out. We do our usual celebration of arts and sciences where we'll be talking about music. Uh, we'll be talking with a physicist to talk to us about music and also how music can be used in, um, in therapeutic ways as well. And then always at the end of those presentations, we will have some presentations from the University of Maine's Honors College and the students they have there working on their theses. So I invite you all to come and join us on the 3rd of April. And there'll be a couple other classes that will be happening uh, between now and then. So that, that's all I have at this point in time. Oh, you're muted gonna say thank you everybody have a great rest of the weekend and uh, you can keep an eye on the main masonic uh, website if you want to also uh, at to, to bring more light.org uh, or you can just go right to the uh, main grand lodge website or look up main masonic college on your search engine and we're trying to update the upcoming classes there so that way you'll kind of always have a, at least a few months out know, knowing what's coming around and maybe mark your calendar all right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you. And those of you over in India, have a great night. Thank you very much.